Good evening, everybody. Nice to see all of you here. I see a lot of familiar faces here in the audience. Welcome. For those of you that are new to UCR Palm Desert Center, welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Agam Patel, um, and I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director here at UCR Palm Desert Center. For those of you that are new here at uh, UCR Palm Desert, uh, we serve as a hub for cultural and artistic and scientific research right here in the Coachella Valley, extending UCR's footprint loud and proud. Uh, we provide a robust schedule of public education offerings for our community, from lectures to our health and wellness programs, as well as a full slate of learning opportunities for everybody at every age. Uh, if you need some more information, please uh, log on to our website or pick up some flyers outside. Um, shout out to all of our students that are coming in from UC Riverside as well as our local high school students here from many of the school districts. I see all of you out here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, tonight I am so thrilled to welcome all of you to our first science lecture series brought to you in partnership with our friends at the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. Um, this has been, um, the, our science lecture series has been a forum for scientists to share their knowledge and research with students, alumni, faculty, staff, and local community members. Each science lecture, each, each science lecture topic tackles some of the most pressing issues we face as a local, national, and global community. From climate science to subatomic particles to supporting sustainable agricultural and water management practices, the 2024 Science Lecture Series will not disappoint. We've got another one coming up in April with uh, Professor Barry Barish, a Nobel uh, laureate himself in April, and then another one here in May. So please pick up a flyer out on your way. Uh, before I welcome uh, Dean Atkinson up here, please allow me to give you a few important reminders of uh, events that are coming up here at UCR Palm Desert Center. Tomorrow, right here, we're uh, partnering with our friends at uh, UCR Jewish Lecture uh, Series. Um, we were talking about the Holocaust of Biafra, anti-Semitism, and genocide in sub-Saharan Africa. We're going to be joined by a doctoral student, Remy Ilona, uh, as well as the Maimonides Chair, Professor Michael Alexander. On March 7th, uh, we are, as part of our Wild Coachella Lecture Series, we're going to be joined by Joshua Tree National Park Rangers, uh, David Larson, and Stacy Manson, who are going to be talking about light pollution. And then on March 14th, as part of our Boyd Deep Canyon Lecture Series, we're going to be joined by Dr. Doug Kelt, uh, who is uh, part of the Department of Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation at UC Davis. So you won't want to miss that. That's on uh, March 14th, next week. And uh, on the 20th, uh, our third and final uh, lecture in the Are We Alone lecture series with Dr. Tim Lyons. We're going to be joined by Michelle Lung, a fourth year candidate who is going to be talking about the search for strange new worlds. So mark your calendars for all of that and much, much more. Um, but for now, please allow me to introduce uh, Interim Dean Peter Atkinson on the stage. Well, thank you, Agam, for the uh, introduction and the warm welcome. On behalf of uh, UC Riverside's College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, or CNAS as we typically call it day to day, thank you for having us here this evening. We're thankful to, to be able to bring the Science Lecture Series back to the Coachella Valley. It was here many years ago and it's a delight to be uh, truly welcomed back. Many of you in the audience are from the main UCR campus at Riverside. Uh, some of you are community members from the Coachella Valley and some of you are students from the local community. And some were re of you were recently admitted to uh, UC Riverside, so congratulations to you and um, please come and visit us in the Dean's office down in the Geology Building uh, when you get a moment, and we'd love to talk to you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Since, its, since its inception, CNAS scientists have shared their knowledge and research with students, alumni, 
faculty, staff and community members uh, throughout the Inland Empire and beyond. Each science lecture series topic tackles some of the most pressing issues we face as a local, national and global community. Today we're going to talk about uh, climate science, which is an issue that uh, is all very well known to us for the impacts it's having on our lives. In just a moment, I'll introduce Dr. Robert J. Allen from uh, the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at UC Riverside to give his presentation on uh, the subject of the escalating climate catastrophe. But before I do that, I'd like to point out that uh, Dr. Allen is a full professor of climatology with the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at our university down in uh, Riverside. He received his bachelor's and master's degree from Cornell University in central New York and his PhD in atmosphere, ocean and climate dynamics from Yale University. He then postdoc at UC Irvine and then followed that with another postdoc at uh, the Scripps Oceanography Institution down at UC San Diego before joining us at UC Riverside. Dr. Allen is a climate scientist who uses state-of-the-art Earth system models as well as a wide range of observations to improve our understanding of the climate system. This includes natural climate variability and the processes, in, processes involved as well as how climate is changing, what is driving that change and how to adapt and mitigate such changes. He has published over 60 peer-reviewed climate research papers and he has received funding from national and international science funding agencies as well as private industry. He has participated in several international climate modelling efforts, including the Aerosols and Chemistry Model Intercomparison Project, the Regional Aerosol Model Intercomparison Project, and the Com Composition Air Quality Climate Interactions Initiative. He is also a contributing author to the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which goes by the acronym IPCC, which you comes to prominence every few years when they have their uh, international meeting at various uh, capitals in the world. And in this, he's included chapters on short-lived climate forces and water cycle changes. Dr. Allen, in addition to his uh, appointment at UC Riverside, currently serves as a research fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies at the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Allen to the podium. Thank you, Peter. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for coming today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about climate change, uh, in particular focused on um, this, this, this escalation of, cl of climate change. Um, here's my title slide. I want to acknowledge uh, my department, Earth and Planetary Science, um, as well as the um, EDGE Institute at UC Riverside. EDGE stands for the Environmental Dynamics and Geoecology Institute, which uh, does research as well as, ha we also have educational missions pertaining to uh, the environment, uh, climate change, as well as sustainability. Um, so my outline is ambitious. We'll see um, how much I can get through. Um, but uh, I'm gonna talk about the current state of the climate system. Um, talk a little bit about climate models and uh, attribution of climate change. So I'm, I'm, I'm essentially a climate modeler. Um, I use climate models to understand recent and future climate change. Um, we'll talk about some climate physics and Earth's radi radiative energy balance. We'll then kind of focus a little bit more locally on, Cal uh, on California and, and the Southwest US. Um, things like how the hydrology cycle's changing as well as temperature, wildfires, um, and then finally, I'll conclude with some, some solutions, um, which, which I refer to solutions as bending the curve. Um, so bending the, the global CO2 emissions curve from increasing to decreasing. Um, warming of the planet is unequivocal. Um, this was the headline uh, press of the IPCC report. Uh, Peter already kind of indicated what the IPCC is. It's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the leading body for the assessment of climate change. Um, it, it, it consists of thousands of scientists worldwide, including myself. Um, so in 2007, this was their conclusion. 
Um, the, the IPCC as an organization, along with former Vice President Al Gore, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for their um, environment and, and, and climate activism. Um, so here we're looking at decades of global warming on the left. So here's the decade, here's the magnitude of the global temperature change. Um, and you can see this, this, uh, this, this warming trend um, over the um, 20th century, progressing into the 21st century. Um, you can see that um, the last four decades, starting in, in, in the 1970s, they've all been warmer than any decade that preceded it. Um, if we zoom in, zoom in, sorry, zoom in on the, on, on, on the top 10 years, um, we can see here that the top, uh, the, the, most, the top 10 warmest years have all occurred in the last 10 years. Okay, so um, this, this, is, uh, you know, this is the motivation for the title of my talk, The Esca Escalating um, Climate Catastrophe. Notice that 2023, um, shown here, is in fact the warmest year on record. Right, so last year was the warmest year on record. Um, it turns out that it's the warmest year uh, on record by far. Um, here we're looking at a, a, a time series here, 1850 to 2000. Each of these dots represents the global average temperature in that year. Um, so if you kind of eyeball things, um, from 1880, um, so about here, to about 1970, you can see a, a, a positive trend. Okay, and the magnitude of this, this trend is about 0 0.04 degrees C per decade. Okay, um, if we look at the last, um, 40 or so years, 50 years, from 1970 to 2003, um, we can see that that slope of the, of the line is, is, is greater, indicating a, a more rapid warming. And the rate of warming over this uh, 1970 to 2023 time period is 0.19 degrees C per decade. If we zoom in on these red dots, um, which is showing you the global average um, temperatures for the last uh, 15 years, um, we can see uh, uh, another um, uh, steepening of the slope. Um, and the trend line uh, over the last 15 years is 0.27 degrees C per decade. Okay, so global warming accelerated um, in 1970, and it appears um, that it is re-accelerating again starting around 2010. Um, I already mentioned how 2023 is the warmest year on record. Um, this is a, a schematic that illustrates that. Um, so we have January over here through December, so these are monthly global mean temperature anomalies. Um, 2023 is shown here. Okay, so we can see how it's um, larger, particularly during the second half of 2023, than any of the other years that came before it. And in fact, you can see that 2023, starting in about June through December, um, is very different than the preceding uh, years. You can see all these other years are kind of overlapping to some extent. Um, you know, this is the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1970s. Um, there's still some overlap, um, but 2023 stands out way above all the other prior years. Um, if we were to average uh, over the calendar year, um, 2023 was 1.34 to 1.48 degrees C warmer than the pre-industrial average. Okay, so this is starting to get dangerous, dangerously close to the warming threshold that most climate scientists uh, feel we should avoid, right? And this, is set, this was set in 2015 by the Paris Agreement. Limit warming to two degrees C above pre-industrial and to pursue efforts to limit uh, warming to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial. Ultimately, to reduce the risk of serious and irreversible climate change. Um, so you can see that 2023 20, is becoming dangerously close to this 1.5 degree C warming threshold. Um, 2024, right? We've, uh, we're in March now. I don't have updated data. Um, it, basically, 2024 is ending here on February 3rd. Um, but you can see the, the record warmth of 2023 has persisted into 2024. Um, 2024 is, is way up here. Um, so we, 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 you, can, you can see that once again, 2024 is, is anomalous relative to all these other years. Right? It stands out leaps and, and, and bounds above all the other years. Um, if we're to average, um, take a global average um, um, temperature, over the past 12 months, um, the, the warming increases to w between 1.48 to 1.54 degrees C warmer than pre-industrial. 
Um, so you can see now we're, we're even closer to this 1.5 degree C threshold as set by the Paris Agreement. Um, so my point so far is that um, you know, warming has been happening. Um, it accelerated in 1970, and then it appears to have re-accelerated starting about 2010. And 2023 and the beginning of 2024 are um, anomalously warm. Um, there are other anomalous or unusual um, or record-breaking um, events in terms of the climate system that have happened in 2023. Um, the Canadian wildfires is one example. Um, so this is the area burned by Canadian wildfires from 1980s um, to 2023. And you can see 2023 is here. Okay, so it's more than double um, any other year that preceded it. Um, I grew up in, in New York State over here, central New York. And I recall having a conversation with my family and they said that they couldn't go outside because it was too smoky. In June, in June of last year. And I thought to myself, that's crazy, <laughs> right? Because this is something that I did not grow up with, but it's something that I've kind of become accustomed to, having lived in California now for about 15 years. Um, so that's how anomalous it was. You can see the, the um, Statue of Liberty here um, with all the, uh, the smoke behind it. Um, and then here's a, here's a map of the United States. The gray is showing you the smoke um, from the Canadian wildfires. And each of these dots uh, represents the air quality at, at these locations. The purple dots um, are uh, very unhealthy to um, hazardous levels of, of air quality. Um, other notable changes from this past um, um, year in 2023. Um, we're gonna go down to the opposite um, pole here, down to, down to the Southern Hemisphere and the Antarctic continent. Um, it turns out that um, 2023, um, the Antarctic sea ice hit a record low maximum. Okay, so what do I mean by a record low maximum? This is the seasonal cycle of Antarctic sea ice area extent. Okay, each of these colored lines represents a different year. And then here's month. The red dashed line is showing you the evolution of Antarctic sea ice area extent for 2023. Okay, so this is the record low maximum that occurred. Once again, you can see that it's very different than all these other lines. It's much lower, and there's no overlap. Um, not only did Antarctica set a record low maximum, um, but it also set a record low minimum in, in March. Um, climate change is associated with climate impacts, uh, many of which have um, economic damages associated with them. Um, so NOAA, um, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, um, has been compiling statistics of the $1 billion weather and climate related events for the United States. So the black line shown here is the long term mean, okay, in terms of the number of $1 billion weather related events. Right? So it's about eight, okay, over a 50 year time period. 2023 is the red line, okay? So 2023 set a new record for the number of billion dollar weather and climate related disasters in the United States uh, with a total of, of 28 such disasters. 3.5 times the long-term average. Um, okay, so that was kind of how 2023 is exceptional um, from, from, from a climate change standpoint. That's put recent warming into a broader context. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a modern climate, modern climate scientist, so my time period of focus is essentially here, from 1850 to 2020 and maybe through 2100. Um, but there are a bunch of climate scientists called paleoclimatologists that study climate change on our planet over much longer timescales. Um, so here we're going back 2,000 years, okay? And this is a temperature reconstruction based on several different climate proxies. So for example, tree rings. Okay, so we can see that the warming in the last century, um, particularly in the last couple decades, is essentially unrivaled in the last 2,000 years. Okay, there's no time in the last 2,000 years where this reconstruction rivals modern day warming. 
Um, in fact, we can make an even stronger statement because this is showing you the warmest multi-century period in more than 100,000 years. Okay, and recent warming, once again, is higher than the warmest multi-century period in the last 100,000 years. Um, so warming is unprecedented over at least 100,000 years. And you can also see the rate of warming, right? So the, the slope of this line, right? The rate of warming is also unrivaled in the last 2,000 years. So the magnitude of the warming is unrivaled and the rate of warming is also unrivaled. Why? Um, it ultimately comes down to fossil fuel combustion, um, largely um, carbon dioxide. Um, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas when, which inhibits our, our planet's ability to radiate heat to space. Um, this is a very famous graph. It's called the Keeling graph after a UC San Diego uh, research scientist who's, who, who started measurements of atmospheric CO2 in Mauna Loa, um, Hawaii. Um, so going back to 1958 through the present, we can see atmospheric CO2 concentrations increasing okay, from about um, 315 uh, ppms in, in 1958 to almost 420 um, today. Um, so this increased atmospheric CO2 is directly related to human activities, largely the combustion of fossil fuels, including coal, oil, as well as natural gas. Um, we, we can extend this record of atmospheric CO2 concentrations um, by looking at ice cores. Right, so this is also the realm of, of paleoclimatologists. Um, and this is from the IPCC report in 2021. So this is atmospheric CO2 concentration from the Epica Dome C ice core in the Antarctic continent. And the time scale here is basically, um, here, here's, here's, the, here's the modern, right, from 1900 to 2020. And we're going back 800,000 years. Right, so that's a very long record from the ice cores. That's about as far back as you can go um, using ice core as a, as a, as a proxy. Uh, but we can see these cycles, right? these ups and downs. Okay? These are the glacial interglacial cycles over the last 800,000 years. And you can see the magnitude of the CO2 variation is something like 100 ppms. Well, if we look at the evolution over the last century, okay, here's the evolution over the last century. And well, it's higher, much, much higher um, today than it has been in at least 800,000 years. Right? And it's not just CO2, it's the other most important greenhouse gases, which is methane, as well as nitrous oxide. Okay? And in fact, this CO2 concentration curve can be extended even further back using different um, climate proxies. And today's atmospheric CO2 concentration is higher than it has been in at least 2 million years. Um, another point um, is that even though there have been these oscillations of atmospheric CO2 in the glacial, interglacial glacial cycles, um, we can see that the rate of change okay, over the last 800,000 years from the ice cores is something like maybe 2 ppm per 1,000 years. The rate of change over the last 100 years is 1 ppm per year. Right? So the rate of change of atmospheric CO2 over the last century is about 10 to 100 times faster than what naturally occurred in those glacial interglacial cycles. Another important point is that climate change is essentially irreversible over human timescales. Um, this is a graph uh, that is based on a carbon cycle model. It goes from 1880 all the way out to the year 3000. And what um, these authors did is to increase atmospheric CO2 emissions at a rate of 2% per year, which is this increase here, okay, until hitting a, a peak, such as 450. And then you immediately shut off CO2 emissions, and you let the carbon cycle work. Right? So this is the carbon cycle removing the excess CO2 from the atmosphere. Right? You can see that. Even at the year, by the year 3000, okay, atmospheric CO2 concentrations are well elevated. And in fact, they remain much above the baseline pre-industrial value, right, 800 years into the future. Okay, and this is because CO2 has a very long lifetime. Um, something like you know, 5 to 10% of it can remain for 100,000 years. And if atmospheric CO2 concentrations do not decrease very rapidly, 
then global average temperature also does not decrease very rapidly. Right? This is the corresponding graph based on global average temperature. Right? You can see here's the peak, and then you stop CO2 emissions immediately and let the carbon cycle uh, operate. Well, the temperature decreases, but not very much. So the point here is that climate change is essentially irreversible over human time scales. Um, other notable um, climate change impacts that have been um, kind of in the news, and, and particularly, particularly in the last year or two, um, involve Arctic climate change. Um, so everyone, well, it, it's, it's well known that the Arctic is warming at a faster rate than the global average. Um, and this um, paper uh, has found that the Arctic is actually warming at four times the rate of the global average. Um, so here, for example, is a bunch of data sets showing very rapid Arctic warming from 1980 to present. Okay, so a steep slope. And then here's the global average, right? So a shallower slope, right? And then if we look at uh, a map of the warming, here's what they define as the Arctic, this dashed line. And here are the temperature trends. So in some regions, um, up to maybe one degree C per decade of warming. Um, often we quantify this Arctic um, amplification by taking the magnitude of the temperature trend at a given um, location in the Arctic and then dividing by the global average temperature trend. Okay, so for example, a lot of these locations are showing you um, in some regions something like a five or six Arctic amplification factor, meaning these areas are warming at five or six times faster than the global average. Overall though, over this whole area that's in the dashed line, about four times the rate. So this has large implications. Um, it means that there's a large decrease in Arctic sea ice, um, as shown here. So this is month on the x-axis, and this is Arctic sea ice extent in millions of square kilometers. Um, this is the, me the median over the last 50 years, and the 10th through the 90th percentile. I've added the last 10 years of data are all the colored lines. All right, so the last 10 years of data are well below not only the median, but the 10th percentile. All right, so Arctic sea ice is decreasing, it's decreasing very rapidly, which is consistent with this very rapid warming in the Arctic. Um, perhaps a concern is that climate models are underestimating the magnitude of this Arctic amplification. All right, so this is the observation of Arctic amplification, that red dot, and then this box plot Okay, which is showing you the median change and then the 25th through the 75th percentile of the change. That represents like a thousand different model simulations. Okay, so only 4% of the model simulations are able to reproduce the magnitude of Arctic amplification over the last 40 years is what's, what, what, what we observe. Where does the heat go, right? Greenhouse gases trap heat. They inhibit our planet's ability to radiate thermal energy to space. Um, about 90% of the heat goes into the oceans. All right, so this is showing that here. Um, this is heat accumulation. Uh, the blue is the ocean. Okay, so you can see the bulk of the heat is going into the ocean. Um, something like 350 zettajoules have gone into the ocean. A uh, zettajoule represents 10 to the 21 joules. All right, so a very large number. Um, all this heat uh, being absorbed by the ocean obviously leads to warming of the ocean, um, which leads to thermal expansion of the ocean, which is one of the components of sea level rise. Another component of sea level rise is melting of snow and ice on land, um, as well as melting of uh, the two major ice sheets on our, con on our planet, both Greenland and Antarctica. Um, in addition to um, you know, a warming ocean leading to thermal expansion and rising sea level, uh, a warmer ocean also provides more fuel for hurricanes, okay? Tropical storms, hurricanes, typhoons, they're all kind of the same thing, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and they also, a warmer ocean also provides more fuel for atmosphere, atmospheric river storms, okay? And this is something more relevant to, to California. Um, atmospheric rivers have been in the news quite a bit in the last month. I'll talk more about them in a little bit. Um, Here's a graph. We're looking at the east coast of the United States. Here's Florida. And all these uh, colored lines are showing you the ocean circulation. So this is the Gulf Stream moving up the eastern coast. You can see it kind of breaks away from the coast and then it forms all these eddies, okay? Um, ultimately, this um, Gulf Stream and then its extension, the North Atlantic Current, um, transport heat 
out of the low latitudes and into the higher latitudes. Um, if we start warming the ocean, um, this circulation will weaken. Okay, and this, um, this Gulf Stream is one component of probably the most important ocean circulation on our planet. It's got multiple names. It's called the Atlantic Mariano, Mariano Overturning Circulation. It's called the Ocean Conveyor Belt, and it's also called the Thermohaline Circulation. And there's a lot of concern that warming of the ocean, in addition to freshwater input from the melting of Greenland, will weaken this ocean circulation, if not cause an outright collapse. Um, so I mentioned a warmer ocean provides more fuel for hurricanes. Um, 2020 was a record-breaking hurricane season for the Atlantic. Um, so this graph is showing you um, all uh, 30 named uh, storms in 2020. This is showing you the trajectories, and the dots are showing you the magnitude of the hurricane. So yellows and reds, for example, are a strong hurricane. The blues are a weaker hurricane or maybe a tropical storm. Um, so there were 30 named storms in 2020. 13 developed into hurricanes, six intensified into major hurricanes, hurricanes, so categories three, four, and five. Um, and you can see a bunch of them made landfall with the east coast, southeast coast of the United States. And in fact, um, 11 of them made landfall with the contiguous US, and this broke a record um, set back in 1916. Um, so this is another concern. Um, uh, in, in addition to um, more intense um, hurricanes, they're, they're forming earlier in the season, right? So the nominal hurricane season for the Atlantic is, is, starts in June 1st. Um, but over the last several years, over the last nine years, seven um, named storms occurred two weeks before June 1st. And this has prompted NOAA to potentially reconsider um, moving up the start date for the Atlantic hurricane season. More fuel for these hurricanes um, leads to stronger storms. And there was a paper that just came out uh, recently um, in, in PNAS. And they're arguing for a category six hurricane. Right now, a category six hurricane doesn't exist. Um, this is the Sam, uh, Saffir Simpson hurricane uh, scale. So category one storm has wind speeds between 74 to 95 miles per hour. Um, right now, this doesn't exist, okay? So any storm with winds more than 157 mile per hour is category five. There's no upper threshold. Uh, but it turns out that five recent storms um, are, are, are much larger than this category five, and they've reached this hypothetical category six with winds of 192 plus miles per hour. Right? So this is showing them here. Um, these are the category six storms with winds of 90 meters per second, which is like 200 miles an hour. Um, climate change may be changing, changing things in non-intuitive ways. Um, it turns out that climate change has impacts on allergy season. Um, it's something that I suffered with growing up on the East Coast um, for most of my life. It turns out that I moved here and my allergies significantly improved uh, because there's a lot less plants here compared to the East Coast. Um, but regardless, um, warming of the planet um, leads to a longer growing season for plants. Okay, so plants live longer, they produce more pollen. Um, you can see in some cases, um, six, uh, a plus 60, uh, plus 60 days to the growing season. Okay, so a longer growing season due to warmer conditions leads to more pollen, which can aggravate um, um, allergies. Um, this projection is showing you that perhaps under a high future emission scenario, that by 2080, um, the pollen count could, could more than double. Okay, so this is due to a longer growing season, but it turns out that an increase in atmospheric CO2 not, not only causes the planet to warm, um, but it also encourages plants to, to grow more. Okay, because plants photosynthesize, they need CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay, so this is something that's been observed um, in, um, in labs, and it's also been observed in the real world. Right, it's called the CO2 fertilization effect. More CO2 in the atmosphere leads to enhanced biomass of plants, um, another way it's been described is green, greening, greening of the planet. Okay, so NASA published a paper a couple years ago showing that up, up to 50% of the Earth's vegetated surface has become greener. Okay, an increase in, in, in leaves. All right, so more 
more plant uh, biomass is also consistent with an increase in pollen. Climate models. Um, this is the tool that I use in my research. Um, a climate model um, is basically, um, if it's, a, it's a, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's a 3D um, mathematical model um, where you basically chop the planet up into grid cells, both in terms of latitude, longitude, but also altitude in the atmosphere and then depth in the ocean, as well as depth in the soil column. Um, in each of these grid boxes, you are representing the important processes for the climate system, which is shown here. Things like um, a representation of the incoming solar radiation, a representation of the outgoing terrestrial radiation, how it interacts with the surface relative, you know, the continent versus the ocean versus sea ice. You're representing surface uh, energy and heat fluxes. You're representing clouds and precipitation processes, um, the cryosphere. Um, so these climate models are, are all encompassing and they basically encapsulate all the important processes um, of our climate system. Um, now, these climate models have become more complex over time. Um, so this is showing you how the resolution, the spatial resolution has improved, um, starting with the first uh, IPCC assessment report in the early 1990s. You can see that the grid spacing is about, the, the grid resolution is about 500 kilometers, and you, you, you can't really make out where this is, okay, because it's too coarse. But if we fast forward to the fourth assessment report, which is in 2007, where the average grid, grid resolution is about 100 kilometers, we can see now that this is Europe and this is, this is Iceland. Okay, so there's been a significant improvement in, 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 in the horizontal resolution of these models. And there's also been a significant improvement in the, in the processes that these models represent. And in fact, global climate model um, is a bit outdated. Um, and nowadays, we use the term Earth system model. Okay, and they gain complexity by, by incorporating more processes that are important for the climate um, um, system, including biological and chemical processes that can feed back to the physics of, of the climate. Right? And these things include things like global, the global carbon cycle, dynamic vegetation, um, atmospheric chemistry, ocean biogeochemistry, and even some of them have a representation of continental ice sheets. Um, so, again, what do we use climate models for? Um, we use them for many things, uh, but one of the things that, we, that, that, that they're really good for is attribution of climate change, right? Understanding the drivers of, of, of modern climate change. So this is an example of that. Um, so this is 1850 to 2000. Um, the black line is showing you the observed evolution of global average temperature. And then the, the, this, this green, greenish line is showing you a bunch of model simulations of the same quantity, but when the model is only driven by solar uh, variations, so changes in the amount of sunlight, as well as uh, volcanic eruptions. So you can see there's a divergence that starts in about 1960 to 1970, right? The, the model simulation shows flat, and the observations are showing the, this, is the, this, is, this is the first acceleration of the global warming that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, now, when you include the human drivers of climate change, in, including, for example, the greenhouse gases in particular, you get the brown line. Okay, so you can see um, that recent warming, uh, particularly from about 1960, um, is, it's, it's inconsistent with natural variations only. And the only way you could, can account for it in model simulations is when you include the human factors, right? the increase in, in, in atmospheric greenhouse gases. Um, so what is the future of climate modeling? It's pretty exciting. Um, you know, these models are the best tool we have to understand drivers of climate change. They're the best tool we have to understand future climate change. They al also allow us to understand how best to um, adapt and mitigate to climate change. So they're very important, but they have uncertainties. Okay, and a lot of the uncertainty has to do with the fact that you're trying to chop up the, the planet into these grid cells that are relatively coarse resolution. Um, but we have um, a significant increase in computational capacity over the last several decades. Um, so this is showing you the, the increase in computational capacity. And in fact, this red line is showing you um, the first um, exascale computing, uh, uh, supercomputing, right? And this is it here. This is the frontier. It's the world's first exas exascale supercomputer. 
Um, it exists at Oak Ridge National Lab, lab Labs in Tennessee. Um, and we're talking exascale means 10 to the 18 operations per second. <laughs> okay, so super, you, you, you can do a lot of things with this. Um, and the goal here, uh, and some, some groups uh, in, in the US, uh, but particularly in Europe, um, have started to try to build what's called Earth's digital twin. Um, can you see any difference between the left and right hand side? Not really. The left hand side is a model simulation, right? It's a global climate model simulation at one kilometer resolution. This is a satellite image. Okay, so if you can start running global climate model simulations at one kilometer resolution, um, some of the uncertainties in these models goes away, right? Because we can now start to explicitly represent things like clouds, um, as well as um, ocean eddies, okay? But they're, they're not gonna, you know, th there are trade-offs. If you think of, think of climate modeling as a triangle, okay? Resolution is one edge of the triangle. Um, number of simulations you can perform is the other edge of the triangle. And then the third edge of the triangle is the processes that you include. Right? Things like atmospheric chemistry, interactive vegetation, okay? And there, there, there are trade-offs. So if you put all your eggs in this basket and try to run a model at re very high resolution, you're, you're going to have to sacrifice these other, other two components of the triangle. So that's why I have the future with a question mark, um, because even though you're going to be running these models at very high resolution, um, you're going to have to sacrifice some components of, 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 the, of the simulation. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, the southwest U.S. and California. Um, here is the drought index for California. Drought area is a percentage from 2000 to 2024. All the colors are some level of drought. Yellow is ab light yellow is abnormally dry, and then this dark brown is exceptional drought, the highest category. So over, um, since the start of you know, the 21st century, California has essentially been in a drought. There's been small interruptions um, for example, you know, 2006, uh, maybe 2011, uh, but for the most part, we've, we've been in a drop, right? And this is called a mega drop. Um, it's, 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 it's a long lasting uh, in terms of time, but also sp encompassing a very large spatial area. Um, there was a study done um, t just, just last year, and what they did is, again, we're, they're, they're appealing to um, paleoclimate proxies, um, largely tree rings, and they were able to reconstruct a measure of drought for the entire southwest U.S., so this, this yellow box, um, over the last, you know, going back to the year 800, right? So this is soil moisture from their reconstruction, um, and then this is showing you the evolution of soil moisture for the entire southwest U.S. <clears throat> this red line is showing you the observed mega drought over the last, you know, from, from two, 2000 to 2021, right? So this... This, this drought anomaly of the last 20 years or so is essentially unparalleled in the last 800. Okay. Um, using a model, right, I've, I've kind of been, been highlighting the importance of, of climate models and, and how they're useful tools. Um, this study then was able to show that, you know, this, this is the um, observed magnitude of the drought, where the darker colors are showing you that it's its rank is one, so it's the worst drought on record. Um, and then this is a model simulation where they have no anthropogenic climate change. All right, so this is similar to this, okay, but this is much stronger. All right, so for, they estimate that 42% of this drought is due to anthropogenic climate change. There's, there's a natural component to it, but 42% of it is, is, is anthropogenic. Um, why does... Why, why, why does climate change, why does warming the planet, why is that associated with drought, right? And another word for drought is, is aridity. Um, it, it, it has to do with, you start warming the planet, um, the evaporative demand of the atmosphere increases, right? So there's more um, demand by the atmosphere for evaporation, okay? Precipitation also increases when you warm the planet, but over land, the the evaporative demand actually exceeds any increase in precipitation, okay, such that the net P minus E, precipitation minus evapotranspiration, is less than zero. It's negative, right? The land is going to dry out. And a simple way of thinking about this um, is that, 
this schematic is showing you a warmer climate. And over land, most of the precipitation that occurs over land originates from evaporation over the ocean. And then that, that, that condensed water vapor is evicted over the, over the continent, where it then precipitates out. Well, it turns out that um, the land uh, warms faster than the ocean, right? Because the ocean has high heat capacity, OK? So when you warm the land more than the ocean, um, there's going to be a larger increase in the uh, saturated water vapor, right? This, this red bar here, OK? So you see there's this big increase in a warmer, in a warmer climate. Right? Warmer, another way of thinking about this is that warmer air can hold more water vapor. Right? It's, it's, it's an exponential function of temperature. It's, all, it's called the clausius clapeyron equation. Um, so the enhanced warming of the land uh, dictates the increase in saturated water vapor. Um, but um, the actual water vapor content over land is being dictated by the advection of evaporated water from the ocean, which is at a colder temperature. Okay, so the, um, uh, the, the, the increase in the actual water vapor, this blue bar, right, this increase is smaller than this increase. Right? So this is consistent with enhanced aridity um, over land in a warming climate. So that's a thermodynamic argument that kind of explains why a warmer planet is associated with enhanced aridity. Um, Rivers in the sky, right? Atmospheric rivers are important for, they're, they're important for, for, for California, uh, but they're important for the uh, west coast of the US in general. And they've had a lot of, there's been a lot of news uh, lately on atmospheric rivers. Um, you can think of, think of them as long, narrow filaments, uh, filaments of atmospheric water vapor, right? So this is showing you an atmospheric river. Right? This is uh, air, air density of atmospheric water vapor. Green are high, higher values. And you can see it stretches all the way to Hawaii, in this case. Um, another word for these atmospheric rivers is Pineapple Express. Right? So this is why it's, another word is Pineapple Express, because sometimes it's, jet, it's, it's, it's tapping into moisture from Hawaii. Um, so these things can transport a huge amount of water, right? 15 times the, the volume, of, volume of water at the, at the, at the um, head of the Miss, Mississippi River. Um, and of course, we have some pretty complex topography in California. We have a lot of mountain ranges, the Sierra Nevadas in particular. So when this uh, plume of moisture interacts with high topography, um, the air can't go around the mountain. It has to go over it, right? So the air goes over it, it cools, and the water vapor condenses and falls out as rain, OK? Um, so that, that's kind of the physics in, in, in a simple way of these atmospheric rivers. How, how does climate change, how does global warming affect atmospheric rivers? Um, there are kind of two competing uh, processes at work. Um, as I mentioned before, warmer air can hold more water vapor. Um, so this implies uh, more fuel for these atmospheric rivers, right? An increase in precipitation associated with the, with the given AR event. Um, but there's also dynamic, dynamic consideration. And as I talked about before, the poles, right, the Arctic, is warming much faster than the lower latitudes. Okay, so this, is good, this weakens the, 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 uh, the low latitude to high latitude temperature gradient, which may weaken winds. Okay, so if, 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 if the dynamics were, uh, dominates, then you would expect um, weaker atmospheric rivers. If the thermodynamics dominates, then you would expect an increase in precipitation associated with these atmospheric rivers. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, this is a study that just came out uh, a couple years ago, 2020. Um, and they use um, a high resolution climate model simulation to try to understand how large increases in greenhouse gases affect atmospheric rivers by the end of the century. Um, so this is the model simulation for the present day. And this is something called integrated vapor transport. It's the amount of moisture associated with an atmospheric river event. Um, and then this is the future um, projection based on their model um, under a high greenhouse gas emission scenario. So you can see much higher uh, values of this integrated vapor transport. And in fact, the main conclusion of this paper um, is that um, this, this, this large increase in integrated vapor transport is due to the thermodynamic effect, right? Warmer air can hold more water vapor, so that leads to more precipitation associated with atmospheric rivers. Um, in terms of precipitation, um, so this is a good study because 
they used um, a high resolution regional climate model. All right, this is the global climate model, which has a grid spacing of about one, 100 kilometers. And then you can see, as you go from a 100 kilometer resolution grid cell to 81, to 27, to nine, to three, um, you can see that you're getting a larger increase in the precipitation associated with each atmospheric river event. All right, this, is the, this, this black line is showing you the outline of the Sierra Nevada watersheds. Right, so this is, again, it's showing you one of the deficiencies of a global climate model, but it's also showing you the utility of increasing the resolution. Um, and kind of the, the, the main result is they found a 10 to 40% increase in total accumulated precipitation associated with atmospheric rivers by the end of the century under a high uh, greenhouse gas scenario. Um, so here's a bit of a summary uh, of how California hydrology is expected to change under continued global warming. Um, this is showing you the change in extreme dry years. Um, so for a given event in the historical record that happens once in 100 years, um, in Southern California, that event is going to happen, happen 2.4 times more frequent. Um, in terms of extreme wet years, an event that happened four times in 100 years will happen 2.5 times as frequent in Southern California. All right, so this is showing us more extreme dry years as well as more extreme wet years. And something interesting is this, it's called weather whiplash. Okay? And you can think of it as um, an extreme dry year is followed immediately by an extreme wet year. Okay? An event of that character that happens four times in 100 years will increase by about a factor of two in Southern California. All right? So both um, more extreme dry years, more extreme wet years, as well as an increase in this dry to wet weather whiplash. Um, okay. California wildfires. Um, here is a time series from 1980 to 2023. Each of these bars represents um, the area burned by California wildfires. Um, you can see this general, this is a smooth, smoothing uh, line. So here's the big increase in the last couple years. 2020 was an exceptional year. Um, if we break things down, this is the 20 largest wildfires in, California, in California's history, starting in 1932. All right, so from 1932 to 1999, there's only three. All right, from 2000 to 2021, um, 17 of the 20 largest wildfires in our state have occurred. Okay, and in fact, um, 10 of them have occurred in 2018 or later. Um, so the fire regime is changing in many locations, including California. Um, but also the Mediterranean, Australia. I've already talked about um, the Canadian wildfires. And in fact, you know, you know wildfires have multiple negative impacts. Um, one of the negative impacts has to do with poor air quality. All right, so this is annual average PM 2.5 particulate matter. All right, so this is the, the particles that cause bad air quality. And over the continental United States, from 2000 to 2015, we can see a decrease. Right, so an improve, improvement in air quality. This is consistent with many clean air policies that the US has invoked uh, to try to clean up the air. Um, but then in 2015, you can see a bit of an inflection point. And in fact, there's a bit of an increase. Most of this increase from 2015 onward um, comes from the west, uh, the southwest, as well as the northwest. Okay, so this inflection point um, is due to this large increase in wildfire activity uh, over the last several years. And in fact, these authors attribute um, PM 2.5 in the Western United States, half of it is due to wildfire activity. And wildfire smoke, increase in wildfire activity is associated with climate change. Wildfires are comp com complex. There are many factors associated with wildfire activity, um, but certainly warming and drying is one driver of the increase in wildfires, as well as the fact that the United States has practiced um, fire suppression for about 100 years. And this, is a lot, this has allowed um, vegetation to build up. Um, so fuels um, have built up that otherwise would have burned off in the past. Right? Fires need fuel. Okay, so if there's more vegetation, um, then um, wildfire activity would be expected to increase.
Uh, a couple more slides and then I'll, 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 I'll wrap up. Um, so in terms of climate physics, um, this is showing you the Earth's, Earth's energy budget. The important thing here is if we focused at the top of the atmosphere, there's energy coming into the system, shortwave energy, and then there's energy leaving the system, right? This is thermal outgoing. Um, in, in a situation of, of equilibrium, those two fluxes are the same, right? Energy in and energy out are the same. We can see here that there's more energy coming in than there's energy going out, right? So if you put more energy into a system than, than, than leaves, the system's gonna warm up, okay? So this is why the planet is warming. And you can see that the reason why there's less energy leaving the system, okay, is due to the greenhouse effect, right? So these greenhouse gases prevent the emission of this thermal energy to space. And in fact, they re-radiate some of that energy back to the surface. If you focus on that top of the atmosphere energy balance, um, there's a quantity that climate scientists use, it's called the effective radiative forcing, that is used to quantify the drivers of climate change. Okay, so this is showing you the temporal evolution from 1750 to 2000 of the top of the atmosphere energy imbalance. The purple line is CO2, okay? It's positive, right? This is the zero line here, All right? So this is showing you CO2 is the dominant driver of warming of the climate system. Um, there are many other lines on there. There's other greenhouse gases, such as methane, uh, which is in the brown, right? Methane is the second most important greenhouse gas behind CO2. Um, all these black lines are showing you volcanic eruptions. Um, volcanic eruptions cool the, the, the climate, um, but they're relatively uh, ephemeral, right? They're short-lived, right? So they don't have a long, they don't have a, a long-lasting effect on the climate system. So for example, Pinatubo, uh, erupted in 1991, it's the largest volcanic eruption in the 20th century, right, shown here, it caused about a half degree cooling, half a degree of global cooling for about a year or two. I wanna draw your attention to this gray line. This gray line is showing you the top of the atmosphere energy balance, this effective radiative forcing from atmospheric aerosols. You can see it's negative, okay? So atmospheric aerosols have acted to offset part of the warming that we would have gotten from the increase in greenhouse gases, right? They've muted the warming from the increase in CO2. Atmospheric aerosols are small particles. They also cause air pollution, it's PM 2.5, right? The aerosols cause poor air quality, but they're also very reflective. They reflect sunlight, which cools the planet. Given the fact that we wanna clean up the atmosphere and all of these clean air policies have been, have been invoked, we can see that there's an inflection point in this aerosol effective radiative forcing, right? It's going, it, was, it was decreasing, but starting in around 2000, it's starting to increase a little bit, right? This means that this cooling effect is becoming weaker, right? So this is one of the leading um, ideas as to why recent warming has been accelerating, which is how I started this talk, right? Over the last 15 years, warming accelerated to about 0.27 degrees C per decade, okay? And it's consistent with the fact that we're cleaning up our atmosphere by removing atmospheric aerosol particles. We're trying to improve the air quality, but it's a double-edged sword, right? Because we're also removing part of this um, muting effect that has kept warming less than it otherwise would be, right? From the increase in greenhouse gases. Um, so I think I'll stop there um, and take any questions if, if yeah, I'll, I'll take any questions. Well, thanks, uh, Bob, for a very, very illuminating uh, presentation. So at this point, as he said, we'll take um, questions from the audience. There's a number of uh, CNAS um, science ambassadors walking around with microphones. So if you wish to ask a question, please raise your hand and the microphone will find you. Raise it nice. Yes, in the centre here. Hi, thanks for the talk. What's the cure?
Um, there's been an explosive growth of renewable energy. Um, so this is uh, solar uh, power, um, en electric en generation per year in terawatt hours, um, 1990 to 2020. So you can see this r ramping up in the United States. Um, China, it's even stronger, uh, which is very important because they're the number one emitter of CO2 in the present day. And then here's the European Union and India. Um, similar results for wind power. Right? So these are examples of renewable energy that are essentially free of carbon emissions. And one of the reasons why there's been this huge ramp up in both wind and solar power um, is because they are, the, the price has come down significantly. Right? So this is um, the cost of renewable energy for both solar and wind. Um, you can see 2009, very expensive. Now in 2023, $60, which is much less uh, than, than, well, it's much less than coal, way less than nuclear, um, and comparable to, to, to gas. Um, so um, renewable energy, which is free of carbon emissions, is one of the key um, solutions. I can talk more on that if you want. Um, So coal power um, has begun to slowly wane. Coal is the worst fossil fuel you can use to generate electricity because it has the most CO2 emissions per unit of energy uh, generated. Um, this is the United States, electricity generation by source from 2006 to 2020, 2022. And you can see coal use has decreased rapidly over this time period. Um, you can see that uh, it's kind of been supplemented with natural gas, which it, it's still fossil fuel, so there's still carbon emissions associated with it, so that's not great, but it's, it's less bad than coal. Uh, and then here's the increase in renewables, okay? And then something similar has happened globally, right? So 2010 to 2022, um, the, sorry, the gray, the gray bar is the, the number, uh, it's the gigawatt uh, of coal capacity that opened in that year, and then the black bar is the gigawatt of coal, coal capacity that was closed in that year. And the difference is showing you this orange line. So the orange line is trending downwards, right? So not only the US, but also globally, there's this downward trend in the use of coal to generate electricity, which is good. Questions down the front? Uh, you took us back 800, how far back did you go for the larger picture? Uh, for the ice cores, it went back 800,000 years. So if you go even farther back, there's been warming and cooling and warming and cooling since Moses was a kid. I mean, that's just the way it's been. But something happened in 1970, you said, that I, I don't get a clear picture of exactly, like it started to increase in 1970, the late 60s or something. What was it? Well, the, yeah, let me go back to that slide. This one? Um, so there, there, is, there is warming um, that preceded 1970, right? From 1880 to 1969, there's still a, a positive slope to the trend line of 0 0.04 degrees C per decade. Um, but then the warming did accelerate starting in about 1970, as shown here. Um, so this is due to a combination of things. Um, it's due to larger, increase is, larger increases in greenhouse gas emissions, okay? And it's also due um, it has to do with these aerosol particles again. Um, the 1950s, the 1960s, we were, we had no um, clean air policies, okay? And we were putting a bunch of uh, uh, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere. This is one of the reasons why we had acid, the acid rain problem in the 1970s. Um, but these um, chemicals also lead to atmospheric aerosols, which cool the climate system, right? So. Um, in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, a lot of the warming signal from the increase in greenhouse gases was being muted even more by the increase in atmospheric aerosols. I'm looking in my head about England in 1850 with those trains rolling down with the, with the smoke belching out and, and you couldn't see in London, England, for, you couldn't see the sun for months at a time. That's all gone now, basically. Right. But you're saying, in 1970, there was something so severe 
around emissions, et cetera, that it, 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 it was much worse than anything in the past? Um, yes. Yes. Warming accelerated in the 19th century. I mean, I, I guess my point is still that the, 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 there is warming over this longer time period. It's just weaker. Um, and then warming did accelerate starting in the 1970s. Um, and it's, it, it's, again, it's due to the fact that some of these clean air policies were invoked in the 70s, which reduced atmospheric aerosol emissions, which removed this cooling effect and allowed the, the warming effect from the increase in greenhouse gases to, to, to really take hold. Um, questions over here in, yeah, you got it. coming down behind you. Hi, I was uh, enjoyed the talk very Thank much. You. Um, I recently had heard a, a program, and I don't can't reference the act, exact program, that as populations expand and more people eat meat, cows are also a problem to our environment. Um, yes. Um, so, so beef um, has the largest carbon footprint of any meat. Um, it's, it's higher than chicken, it's higher than pork, um, it's higher than lamb. Um, so so if, you, if you want to reduce your carbon footprint, um, well, don't eat any meat, right? Become a vegetarian. Um, but if you want to have some impact, eat less meat. Um, and in particular, uh, eat less beef. Um, so yes, beef has the highest carbon footprint of any uh, meat product, and that's because cows require a lot of energy to, to grow. Okay, so they require a lot of uh, energy input, and if you're, you're on, if you have a, a cattle farm where all the tractors and equipment are, are you know internal combustion engines, then that that that's a source of CO2. But then cows themselves are a source of methane, mm -hmm. right? So, and methane is is the second most important greenhouse gas behind CO2. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of uh, interest in reducing methane emissions. Um, there's something called the global warming potential. Um, which basically puts other greenhouse gases on an equal footing to CO2. Okay, so CO2 has a global warming, global warming potential of one. Methane has a global warming potential of about 25 over a 100-year time scale, which means that every molecule of methane is 25 times more potent than is a molecule of CO2. Um, so yes, cows are, actually, are, are also a source of, of methane emissions. Uh, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, which is another reason why beef um, has, has the largest carbon footprint of all, all the meats. What do we do about that? <laughs> Some questions <laughs> over here. Yeah well, yeah, yeah, well, I guess what do you, you, you try to eat less, less, less beef, um, and obviously there, there, there are things that um, farmers can do um, to be a little bit more uh, uh, efficient, uh, but there's always going to be some carbon emissions associated with, 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 with cows. Um, yeah, um, there, there, you can feed them different food, for example, different types of food that actually has been shown to reduce their, their methane emissions. So this is one example of, of things that can be done. Yes, here. So um, it seems that the, <clears throat> maybe I have this wrong, that the, the heat that we're talking about is always ra radiation, uh, thermal radiation from the sun. It's, and what we're doing as <clears throat> anthropologically, uh, humans are, are doing is either putting aerosols which reflect some of that back up yeah. or, or putting up uh, something else uh, which is, uh, enables us to, it keeps the heat uh, retained when it wouldn't ordinarily be. So it's something we're, we're putting into the atmosphere that either makes it the heat better or worse. Is that right? <coughs> But the heat is always, it's in, in, the sunlight. It's thermal radiation that is, is, is warms our planet and every other planet that has, to some extent, that has sunlight hitting it. 
so sunlight is the ultimate warmer of the planet, but we also have a greenhouse effect on this planet, yeah, yeah. which actually keeps our planet about 33 degrees C warmer than it otherwise would be. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so then theoretically, uh, rather than messing around with all these gases, why don't we just sort of semi-block this, the radiation, the thermal radiation, by putting a big umbrella between us and the sun? Yeah, so this, these are geoengineering uh, solutions. Um, uh, so here's a nice slide that kind of encapsulates all the different ideas with geoengineering. And there are two different um, uh, large categories of geoengineering. Um, on the right-hand side is one category, solar radiation management, or SRM. Okay, so this involves what you're saying. It involves increasing the amount of sunlight that our planet is reflecting back to space, which would have a cooling effect. And you can see that there's many things that have been proposed. Um, there's things like pumping sea salt into the air, which then seeds clouds and makes clouds brighter which reflects more sunlight, which will cool the planet. Um, the, here, here are the space mirrors you talked about over here. Right? So this is put, putting some kind of uh, barrier, um, some kind of umbrella, as you called it, or mirror out in space, um, ultimately with the same goal of reducing the amount of incoming sunlight. Um, so these ideas exist. Um, the problem with these ideas, uh, one, one problem with that idea is that um, if you do nothing to stop the increase in atmospheric CO2, um, it turns out that only half of the CO2 that we emit stays in the atmosphere. And about a third of it goes into the ocean, and about a third of it goes into the plants, right? The CO2 fertilization effect. So the CO2 that goes into the ocean leads to ocean acidification, okay? And this is bad for many marine organisms. It's bad for um, submicroscopic organisms that have calcium carbonate shells. Um, so solar radiation management uh, may be able to offset uh, an increase in greenhouse gas warming, but you still aren't doing anything regarding the increase in atmospheric CO2, which, for example, causes ocean acidification. So this is historical emissions um, up until 2020, and this, is the, this, is, this was the projection before the Paris Agreement in 2015. So in 2014, uh, this, this is gigatons of, of, of CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions. Um, so by 2100, uh, the pre-Paris pathway is something like 3.6 to 4.2 degrees C of global warming. All right, so much higher than uh, we want. Um, after the Paris Agreement, um, we've bent, bent, bent the curve a little bit, okay? This is the post-Paris trajectory, um, something like 2.7 to 3.1 degrees C of warming by the end of the century. Um, and then when you factor in some commitments, so this is current policies and, and kind of um, commitments on paper. Uh, this is the yellow, this yellowish line. Um, we're down to about 2.1 degrees C to 2.4 degrees C. Um, so we're still above that uh, two degree C Paris uh, Agreement, and obviously well above the 1.5 uh, degree C Paris Agreement. If we want to follow the Paris Agreement, we need to follow this blue path, right? So this is 2020, this is 2030. We need a 50% reduction in global CO2 emissions this century, okay? 50% reduction, and then by about 2065, we're net zero globally, right? If we want to stay on this 1.5 degree trajectory.
My question really is similar to the gentleman's just before me, and that is if the CO2, even with action to reduce it, remains at such a constant rate and doesn't leave us very much at all, uh, philosophically, how do we keep nurturing next generations and educating them and such? And how do you folks who deal with this in your minds every single day, how do you go on? How do you say, what's it all for? I mean, it's not looking very good for our future. Um, well, I think that a question applies to all of us, right? Uh, not, not just me as a climate scientist, uh, but, but, but all of us. Um, I, I, I guess my, 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 you know, if I were to end this, it, it, it's not a pessimistic note. Um, you know, we are bending the curve, um, as I showed, um, and this is consistent with a large ramp up, you know, booming uh, solar and, and wind. Um, we, we need to accelerate that. Um, we need to do it this decade, um, but, but things are moving at a faster rate than most people think. Well, that's a positive note to end because, well, because, you know, this has been a, an issue since the start of the Industrial Revolution and it's really caught up with us, I'd say, in the last you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years in terms of it being recognised, I think, initially by scientists at uh, Goddard. And I think as a civilization, we are already starting to make changes. We have a ways to go, but we certainly... Uh, appear to be on the path of addressing the problem, but we still have some significant uh, challenges ahead of us. So I want to once again uh, join with me in thanking Robert for a very um, <laughs> stimulating <laughs> seminar. And we'll just go to the last, the last slides. Where are the, the last slides? So whilst we find the uh, slides for um, the last slide, which shows what's coming up next, there we go. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Assistant Dean Joanne Young, who is over here, and her team of science ambassadors for uh, putting on uh, this event tonight. And thank you for all that hard work. And then uh, we have two more to go. So the next one will be uh, Barry Barish, who is a Nobel laureate, who, along with his colleagues, discovered uh, gravity waves, uh, which were predicted by Einstein uh, almost 100 years ago. Uh, more than 100 years ago, and he'll be talking down at our Riverside campus on Tuesday, April the 30th, in the large auditorium down there, and then we'll return here on May 14th for Elias Scuderio's uh, talk on precision agriculture and remote sensing, which uh, is another way of addressing what Robert was talking about in terms of being more economical and more productive with our agriculture, in other words, getting more for actually doing less in terms of contributing to uh, the carbon footprint. So thanks again for coming tonight. We really appreciate you coming out to listen to Robert and we look forward to seeing you hopefully down in Riverside for Barry's talk and then back here in May for uh, Elia's talk on precision agriculture. Thanks so much. <laughs>